any event that takes place in this room uh, has to include an opening joke that it's all about the framing. So, um, <laughs> Adair, you, you did frame the conversation, I think, very powerfully. I'm, I'm just worried that somebody's come and nicked all the paintings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I haven't said, and I wouldn't say, is that your speech was <laughs> devoid of content. <laughs> um, so uh, it, this framing obviously included uh, comments about accounting, but much more. So maybe, um, I, I don't know how much time we have for this discussion, uh, but uh, I, I would... As they don't want to frame. <laughs> so, so, so as long as I don't hear uh, uh, screams of uh, 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 frustration in the room, um, that I, I, I will keep discipline. Anyway, um, Hans, uh, can you give us your reaction as uh, an accounting standard setter who also has broader experience of financial and economic policy making? Well, I am afraid that I agree 100% with everything that uh, Adair said, including the role of mark-to-market accounting. Um, we always get the question, what role did accounting play in the crisis? And we always get, tend to get a little bit defensive. Well, the role of mark-to-market -market accounting was actually very limited, which it was. <laughs> um, but I think more importantly, we only prescribed mark-to-market -market accounting where it was truly uh, inescapable for uh, traded securities. And most, um, <laughs> uh, most of these uh, collateral requirements uh, were uh, traded uh, securities. More generally about IFRS, I actually think, uh, if we're not, let's try not to be defensive. I think IFRS did a fantastic job before the crisis. We were the only standard that showed the naked truth about the leverage in the financial system. Um, IFRS showed the full extent of the undercapitalization of the uh, banking system. It showed, for example, that uh, a bank like RBS, uh, before it did its takeover, perhaps had 2% capital uh, and, 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 and most of it uh, uh, goodwill, uh, and that it uh, w w was probably uh, severely uh, undercapitalized, as, as was borne out uh, by, by uh, the facts. Other than US GAAP, which allows banks to net their derivatives, which is a huge part of the balance sheet, um, the balance sheet of RBS would have looked 30, 40% smaller under uh, US GAAP, so I think that's a, a, a big advantage of IFRS, a very disciplined um, uh, uh, standard. And unlike the prudential standards, which should have been more prudent than the accounting standards, but were instead much less prudent and made these 2% capital into 12% Basel ratios through the system of risk weighting of assets, which still exists. So I think before the crisis, we did a pretty good job. After the crisis, the, the, showed, uh, the, uh, the, the crisis showed uh, deficiencies in, uh, our, uh, in, I, in uh, IAS 39, 39, mainly the incurred loss model, which allowed banks to pretend too long uh, that their loan portfolio was still okay and, and, and allowed them to pretend and extend and not face reality uh, quickly enough. And that's what we uh, tried to fix in IFRS 9. And there, um, basically what Hans gave us is IFRS did well, uh, prudential standards did less well. Uh, so you were not an accounting standard setter, but you were a prudential uh, supervisor. <laughs> Uh, so, can you give us uh, perhaps your reaction to both statements? Well, if I could be very precise about my career <laughs> as, a <laughs> <laughs> as a prudential regulator, um, I became uh, chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority at one minute past midnight on the morning of uh, Saturday the 20th, 2008. Slightly odd that I joined on a Saturday. I have to say it was because Callum rang me the last the previous Monday and said, when does your contract say you're starting? And I said, it, start, it says I'm starting on Monday the 22nd of September. And he says, well, my contract says I'm finishing on uh, Friday the 19th. And given what's going on at the moment, we can't have a two-day delay. Um, <laughs> and in the course of the week, the Treasury rewrote my contract um, to say that I was starting on uh, Saturday the 20th. So, uh, I can honestly say I was not a financial regulator before the crisis. What do I now believe? Um, what do I now believe? Uh, you were a banker. I, I was a banker. 
Um, and as I say in the preface to the book, which I'm just about to produce, which is a wonderful excuse to just do a piece of completely naked marketing, uh, <laughs> October this year, it's called Between Death and the Devil, Princeton University Press, very fine book, please read it. Um, uh, as I say in that preface, I had no idea, even a week before I was appointed chairman of the FSA, what a big financial crisis there was. I'd, I'd been on the board of a bank, I'd spent most of my time at McKinsey working in the banking system, and I thought I understood banking risk. I'd been looking at the emerging risks um, over the previous year, and I had no idea that in autumn 2008, the slowly removing crisis was going to accelerate. Indeed, I remember saying to my wife in early September, you know, I'm going to look forward to this job, and it's going to be fascinating because there's a lot of mopping up to do, there's a lot of re-regulation, a lot of thinking about it, but I, I'm rather like, sad that I've missed all the exciting uh, bits. <laughs> <laughs> well, 15 days after I started, I was sitting with uh, uh, the Chancellor at Strecker and the Finance uh, 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 and, and the Governor of the, the, the Bank of England with the, all of the banks offered us, us discussing the fact that we we're going to part nationalise RBS and HBOS. So that was enough excitement for, for most people. So what does that tell me? It tells me that I, like most people, just had found it impossible to imagine how inherently unstable a banking system could be. And I think in retrospect, there was a, actually this was the reply um, to the Queen. When the Queen asked her question, the LSE Economics Department thought very carefully about it and went away and six months later wrote a letter <laughs> from the head of the department. It said, dear ma'am, you have to call the Queen, dear ma'am, um, uh, you asked us why nobody saw it coming. She said, there has been a collective failure of imagination on the part of a lot of apparently very clever people. And I, it, it, somehow we failed to realise that the banking and credit creation system is fundamentally unstable. And therefore, I think we had allowed banks to run not just with too little equity, but with dramatically too little equity. So basically, you accept Hans' critique. I, ha oh, I entirely accept Hans' critique of the Basel II and Basel I standards. I think since then, we have probably, through the combination of actions on the numerator and the denominator and the ratios, we probably effectively increased the required capital requirements of banks by something like eight to ten times. And if I was a benevolent dictator of a greenfield economy, I'd increase them more. I think we were running the banking system with radically, radically too low capital requirements. What about Hans's first statement about IFRS? Because you said at the end of your address that uh, basically macro is not the addition of micro, right? In, yep. in policy terms, we need macroprudential tools. We cannot just count on risk management and decentralized market discipline. So where do you put financial accounting standards here? Are they micro or are they macro? I think they're basically micro, and therefore we have to have a set of micro uh, lean against them. Now, if I was to criticize IFRS, I would not criticize it on the mark-to-market -market application to the trading book, because there's no alternative. I would criticize the prudential environment for not having powerful enough offsets to the potential pro-cyclicality that market market can have. And I think in particular, while in general we had too little capital in the banking system, the area where we had unbelievably too little capital uh, was in the trading books of the banking capital. But if I go back to the incurred loss on the banking yeah. books, I think that was an error. Yeah. So in my job as a director of Standard Chartered, and on the Risk Committee of Standard Chartered and the Audit Committee of Standard Chartered, I do remember at the end of 2007, we would have liked to put in more provisions because we thought the world was a risky place. We felt that out there somewhere in our portfolio of SME lending in India and property developers in Thailand, there was, as it were, a known unknown. And we said, cannot we provision more aggressively? And we were told by our auditors, no, you cannot. Because incurred loss says you can only recognize something where there is an event. And we said, well, we don't know what the event is, but the event has occurred. Now, that is essentially what the expected loss is now saying. It's, that it's now saying you have got to anticipate that any portfolio has within it the danger of something that you don't let know. So I do think 
the incurred loss model as it existed before the crisis was a mistake and that we have headed to a better model now. So we're good now. We're good under Prudential <laughs> with Basel III. We're good under accounting with uh, well, well, expected no. loss. Uh, uh, what, uh, what is there to improve no, that? No, I, th I think we, we uh, uh, Dara and I both agree that st even after all the increases in capital that took place, uh, I still think the, uh, the banking system is still too highly leveraged, yeah. uh, given, uh, given that the, the economy is still on methadone uh, yep. and, and uh, we, we don't know uh, whether there will be a new crisis and whether and these buffers will be enough. And funnily enough, the, <coughs> the bit that I would particularly challenge is the capitalization of the apparently low risk elements of the portfolio. Such as Greek debt. No, no, no not such as, well, well uh, no, yeah, no, 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 I, that's still well, zero well, risk. Well, in, in there is a problem <laughs> around Europe, the problem around Europe that we've made a category error, which is that we have treated national Eurozone debt, which Charles Goodhart correctly describes as sub-sovereign debt, yeah. debt issued by an entity which does not have currency printing power. Yeah. We have treated that as the equivalent as US Fed bonds or UK gilts, and it is not the equivalent. It is the equivalent of state of California debt or state of Illinois debt. And mm. nobody would treat that as low risk. And nobody would suggest that it is at all a sensible thing to suggest to a bank that happens to be centered in California or centered in Illinois that it should hold as its liquid asset portfolio an undiversified holding and of it, Illinois straight. I mean, th th that is a madness. But the point I was wanting to make was not on the government debt. It's actually on prime mortgages. I, I, there's a great thing to try with just an ordinary member of the public. And what you do is you say this, look, we've now got roughly 10% capital weights against uh, uh, you know, risk-weighted assets. But a prime mortgage portfolio, that can be rated at 10% risk weighting. So that means that a bank can lend a mortgage with 1% of capital support and 99% of debt finance. Do you think that's a sensible thing to do? I will tell you that if you try that with a non-banker uh, and an ordinary member of the public, they'll say, oh, are you completely mad? I mean, it just sounds crazy. And as it happens, uh, it, it is crazy. I think, I think there is an error in the idea that we should leave the setting of risk weights entirely to advanced IRB models. I think there should be minima set by regulators it's, within it's, that. It's like, um. it's like companies setting their own, own accounting rules. It's crazy. It's not audited either. Uh, it, it, there is no discipline around these uh, models. It is, it's incredible that this is still being allowed. OK, uh, as uh, I, I've been asked to moderate, and uh, it's a difficult job, with, uh, <laughs> I can tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but as a moderator, I'm uh, uh, slightly uh, concerned by the extent of consensus on this table. Right. Uh, so let me call for a bit uh, more controversy, and, and um, I have uh, tons of questions to the uh, speakers, but, uh, but I'd like the questions to come for, from the floor. So it is well known, too, that uh, accountants or accounting professionals um, tend to be uh, shy and restrained in their verbal expressions. Uh, which is probably fit and proper, but I would ask you to uh, make a departure from there and uh, ask the questions that you really would want answers to. Please. And as usual, the, the rules of engagement as are uh, to introduce yourselves and to try to uh, uh, include a question in your statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'll certainly do the latter. I'm Hugh Smart, Chief Investment Officer of British Steel Pension Fund. We're a large investor in banks. Uh, I'm an accountant, I pay my fees, but I haven't practiced for almost 30 years. Could the panel address the treatment of, uh, or the application of fair value accounting to banks' own debt? Oh. Yeah, please. Yes, that was, I'm glad you mentioned it because that was a second weakness in, uh, yep. in IFRS and we took care of that in IFRS 9 as well. It gave, there, you, can hold a, you can develop an economic theory behind it but it gave completely counterintuitive results that uh, banks that uh, were in trouble uh, had a decreasing liability because of this own credit uh, being blown up. Uh, so uh, that was not good and, and, and we addressed it and hopefully uh, the standard will soon be endorsed. Brief comment on this, there. I agree entirely with that. Very good. <laughs> uh, you make my job easy. Yeah. Please, um, at the end.
Marietta Mimitz. I'm a pharmaceutical analyst and I sit on the CMAC. Um, and uh, I have a question that I've been trying to get answered for years and nobody knew the answer, so I'm going to try tonight. Um, Lord Turner, you said that um, there has been proliferation of sort of questionable contracts. So in that context, I'd just be really interested in a high-level view as to what has really been driving the staggering $500 trillion gross nominal interest rate derivatives volume. Has it just been banks trying to take a pos di directional position in order to maximize earnings? Has it had to do with QE? And in particular, um, what do you think is really the systemic risk if there's sort of a nuke blowing up somewhere in the middle? So let's say Greece exiting the Eurozone and some of these contracts going bad. Is there a massive chi chain reaction across the whole global banking sector? Well, mm -hmm. I don't think the explosion of derivatives has much specifically to do with QE. I mean, the particular derivative positions taken may be affected that, but the growth of derivatives... Uh, which is dramatic from 1980 onwards, first with the growth of interest rate uh, derivatives and then with the growth of a credit uh, a derivative uh, 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 from uh, uh, credit default swaps from the mid-1990s. That, that, that was well in place before 2007 and 8 and before it. Um, I think the essential thing to think about derivatives is that they can be used to hedge, but this is the great irony of financial market innovation. Anything which can be used to hedge can also be used to take a pure position. And therefore, their impact on overall systemic stability is ambivalent, because if the vast majority of them are being taken to simply take positions, then they may be increasing the potential volatility of the system rather than doing what they're meaning to say, which is hedged. Uh, for instance, take credit default swaps. I mean, credit default swaps could clearly be a sensible innovation to say, I have on my balance sheet a certain you know, set of exposures for a set of reasons, maybe to do with relationship, etc. I don't want to actually sell them. I want to uh, hedge them. That was the idea developed by JP Morgan when they originally developed credit default swaps, and there was a credible story about improving hedging. By 2006, and the brilliant description of this is Michael Lewis's The Big Short, there was such a desire to use the CDS market to take short positions on US credit securities that we were running out of US credit uh, subprime credit securities uh, to take positions against. So people started the wonderful thing of inventing what they called synthetic CDOs, which didn't really exist, which referenced other CDOs, in order to have enough things for other people to create CDS positions against. Now, this was simply a proliferation of positions which I think played no socially useful, useful role at all and which simply magnified risk. However, we allowed those to proliferate because the capital we were requiring against trading book activity was unbelievably low because we based the capital off VAR-based models, and they all had sophisticated VAR-based models to say that provided they had a relatively small amount of collateral with some relatively small haircuts, they couldn't possibly lose any money. So we allowed a proliferation of the use of derivatives way beyond their useful role as a hedging device. Does that answer the questions you have waited five years for? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zhang. I'm a simple accountant. Not so complicated. I will introduce you, uh, Zhang Wang, you uh, go uh, of the International Accounting Standards Board. I'm board member from China for eight years already. Before that, I was chief accountant and international director of Chinese SEC. It seems you describe issues too complicated because, you know, I, s I, I see one angle of analysis is very simple. This related to my experience, a visit to U.S. Uh, in 2005, 10 years ago. I accompanied my chairman to SEC and uh, Goldman and others. And we, during that time, we want to learn everything from the developed world, particularly the United States, UK, and others. And we attend a seminar by Goldman. The economist from Goldman told us before the crisis, she predicted there might be a crisis. And he say, she said the simple reason is very simple. That is, from that year, Bernanke start to increase interest rate. And she worried very much something may happen. 
in the coming years. My question to you is, now we keep low interest rate for so many years. What will happen if suddenly, you know, the whole world increase interest rate within one year from 0% to 5%? I don't want to make things so complicated. Very simple questions to you. <laughs> well, if the Federal Reserve over the next year increase the Fed Fund's target rate from its current level of zero to a quarter to 5%, I think it would be complete carnage. And I think the probability of that occurring zero. is less than a tenth of 1%. I think it's just not going to occur. Um, I think the Fed will probably increase interest rates by a quarter percent, probably in September. But if you look at what's called the famous dot chart in the uh, Federal Reserve, if you look at the latest FOMC minutes today, which have for each member of the FOMC what is their prediction of what interest rates will be at the end of 2016 and at the end of 2017. Um, uh, the median of that suggests that uh, interest rates will not be above about two and a quarter, two and a half percent till the end of 2017. And I think that is right. I think we are still living in a deep period <coughs> of debt overhang. I think we now have, in addition to a debt overhang in the advanced economies, a major debt overhang in the Chinese economy, in particular of uh, local government debt and property debt and SOE debt in the, in the heavy uh, industrial sectors, as you well know. Um, uh, 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 Chinese debt on the total social finance measure has gone from 125% of GDP to over 215% uh, since 2007. So we have a very large uh, overhang of debt. Um, and I think uh, the world economy simply cannot absorb uh, a rapid return to what we thought as pre-crisis norms. Nor do I think it needs to from the point of view of inflation, um, uh, because I see almost no inflationary pressures anywhere in the world, except in Argentina, where I've just been, but there's some specific reasons for that. I mean, anywhere in the... Maybe uh, another country uh, will uh, join uh, soon. Yeah, yeah, maybe but another country will... Is that not exactly what we to told ourselves before the no, crisis? No, no, no. no, no, and, no and, I, and before the crisis, one of the main reasons why we got in this mess was that monetary policy was way too lax, and it was much too cheap to get into debt, and it still is. And well, one, of the, one of the reasons why we are not deleveraging is because there's no incentive to deleverage, because it's so cheap to have debt. Well, I agree with that, and I said that one of the problems for, with uh, uh, ultra-loose monetary policy is that it only ultimately works by re-stimulating the very growth of, that got us into the mess exactly. in the first place. I think we have a fundamental <coughs> problem with too much debt in the world. I'm in the same car, ca camp as Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff, who say, if you think we are simply going to grow out of this debt burden, you are fooling yourself. I think we are not going to simply grow out of this de debt burden. And I think you have to consider about three or four different alternative strategies. One, which has been suggested by Olivier Blanchard and uh, Ken Rogoff at different times, is to run with a somewhat higher rate of inflation for a number of years. Most people don't like that. Another is overt debt write-offs. And by the way, they're going to occur. Yes. At the end of this process, Greece is not going to repay 320 billion of debt. It's simply not going to. I don't take many bets in life, but I'll take that bet. Uh, it is not going to repay that debt, that's one. So some of it's going to be written off, and some of it is going to be permanently monetized. The Bank of Japan now owns about half of the Japanese government debt, which is not owned by other bits of the Japanese government sector, like the Social Security Fund. I don't think there's ever going to be an exit from that. That will be permanently owned by the Bank of Japan. So we will get out of this by some mi mixture of debt write-off, monetization, uh, but right at the moment, we can't increase the interest rates. It would shock the, the but not by 5%. We, we should increase them, uh, but it's not going to go to 5%. So um, if there is no other urgent questions, well, I'm unlucky there are. Yep. Uh, maybe we take the last one and then three, we'll wrap three, up. Two or something. Association for Financial Markets in Europe. Um, well, Tony, you mentioned a couple of times uh, the phrase increased market completion. Yep. And I, I might be remembering wrongly, but I think you said it was a received wisdom that that sounded like a good thing and <coughs> yep. much like other assumptions. Um, and it called to mind at the moment, uh, I think everybody seems to be working on the capital markets union and completion of the single market. 
I, which again sounds like a very good thing. I just wondered whether there were any risks sort of within that that we should be, be thinking about. I'm not worried about risks in the capital market program of Europe. I am worried that people are expecting of it something which will not occur. I hear people saying the US gets 70% of the finance from capital markets, 30% from banks, vice versa. And they then say there's a shortage of finance to SMEs in Europe. So the answer is capital markets, securitization. In terms of the explanation of why the US looks like the looks different from Europe, SMEs have nothing to do with it whatsoever. There is no country in the world where securitized credit plays other than a trivial, 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 trivial role in SME finance. Nor is it the case that capital markets, you know, classic single name corporate bonds, reach further down the size spectrum in the US than Europe. Indeed, it's slightly the other way around. So there may be useful things in the capital markets program, but if you think it's going to solve SME finance, that is just one of these delusions that people latch onto, repeat to themselves, and after they said it three times, they believe it, but it's not true. <laughs> okay, I, I, I have the, the, the frustrating ro role to uh, make it easier to you to, uh, for you to, to get to the buffet. I, I think we, we, we uh, succeeded in uh, having the discussion on Greece uh, only after, I think, one hour and 15 minutes uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, session, which I can tell you by current standards is a major achievement and shows our focus. Um, and uh, I think more importantly, um, we were not only, uh, or I should say, there and hence, we're not only strong on framing, but also on content, on perspective, on figures, and on color, uh, which uh, makes this room an adequate, um, uh, f not uh, um, well venue, but uh, but with uh, with content added. So thank you so much. Um, I understand under the control of uh, Chairman Prada that uh, we have all sorts of good things upstairs, uh, and uh, uh, we you. I don't know how I am empowered to speak on behalf of the IFRS Foundation, but uh, I was asked to let you know that uh, you are invited to uh, enjoy them now, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.